Hey, everybody. Welcome back to my show. This is the Devotional Hearts Show, and I am Allison. You can find me on Instagram at a devotional heart. And if you've been watching this show for a while, you know that I'm adding a new show to my channel, which is a live stream show. And that's a little bit of a different type of a show. And I'm getting more clergy and authors and iconographers for the Devotional Hearts show. However, today I have a guest who is newly baptized. He happens to be one of my first Orthodox friends in real life. And his conversion story is so interesting that I asked him to be a guest on this show because I really wanted to have it on the podcast and I haven't been uploading my live streams to my podcast. I'm keeping the podcast just for the devotional heart show. And I wanted my friend Basil to be part of the devotional hearts podcast and YouTube show. So here he is Basil. Thank you so much for being my guest today. Yeah. Well, well thank you for letting me be the first, uh, you know, one of the first people that, that you know in real life to, to come, come yeah. on and share my experience. So. Yeah, well, um, so I definitely want to get into that. And don't forget, after you tell your conversion story, I want to ask you about your patron saint as well. So remind us to talk about St. Basil. And um, we're going to talk about some books that you are going to recommend to my audience. I'm going to talk about spiritual warfare. And um, I'm going to be asking you what it's like to be newly illumined. And um, so let's start from the beginning. And can you tell my audience just like how you were raised, what types of spiritual um, adventures you've been on, on yeah. your way to finding orthodoxy? Okay. So, uh... We're going to be chasing a few rabbits with this one. So um, I, I grew up, um, I'm originally from, from Atlanta, from Georgia. Um, so I was raised uh, Methodist, um, which is uh, one of the mainline Protestant branches uh, of Christianity. And uh, my parents had me baptized as an infant. And uh, my parents and I, uh, you know, we growing up, um, in my old town, we went to church pretty often. And my grandmother also uh, came from, you know, um, a large distance away, about 30, 45 minutes away to actually, you know, come come to church with us often. Um, and, you know, I you know, just, if anyone has that experience of growing up in a Protestant tradition uh, uh, from the mainline churches, it's, um, you know, you, you get raised, um, you know, going to Sunday school, um, you know, having, having the Bible be taught to you in a very kind of storybook kind of fashion. You know, I remember, you know, learning, doing like coloring books of like Noah's Ark and, um, um, and Exodus and, you know, Genesis and other things like that. Um, and I'd like to think that, you know, my parents, um, raised me very, you know, with, with God kind of at the center. Uh, things kind of changed um, after a while, um, and, but I can also say that my grandmother um, has been uh, very much a, uh, a stalwart uh, in um, believing in Christ, um, and I kind of attribute a lot of her prayers and her devotion to, you know, never allowing me to fall too far away uh, from from the faith, let's just say. Um, but yeah, so, so I grew up Methodist and, you know, gr growing up, I, I, I enjoyed it to a certain extent. And then, you know, at a different, in another, you know, uh, tense of it, I kind of didn't, sometimes I didn't really enjoy going to the church, especially whenever I was younger. And then um, right around the time I was, I don't know, I would say like eight or nine, my, my Methodist church started implementing, um, the, the kind of Christian rock sort of worship service. So we had a gymnasium in our church and they, um, they started introducing that. And I preferred going to that a lot more than actually sitting in, in the pews and, and listening to um, the long sermon that, that our, our preacher would give. Um, and I kind of also attribute that, um, that sort of development in the church to my 
to me becoming more um more apathetic towards the faith and kind of seeing the faith as kind of more as like an accessory more as a kind of I don't know, social gathering that you go to every week just to listen to some music. Mm -hmm. um, and, I, you know, I hate to paint it as that, but I also feel like that's, you know, just on the um, from the outside looking in, that's what, what I feel like um, a lot of um, a lot of mainline Protestant uh, denominations are going into a less in, into a certain extent, you know, the the, the Catholic Church, unfortunately. Um, but at uh, at the age of like 12, uh, there was this um, rekindling, this, uh, this kind of uh, uh, zealous uh, see that came about um, at 12. And I really wanted to, you know, be confirmed. Um, you know, the, the Methodist church, you know, comes from uh, the Anglican tradition. And so the Anglican church um, maintained a lot of kind of some of the high church sort of stuff from Catholicism. So they did confirmations kind of in the, in the, in the usual way that Catholics would do uh, uh, confirmations for their, um, for like 12 and 13 year olds. And so I went through that process of actually getting confirmed um, in the Methodist church. Um, so we had classes and everything else, catechism, and whatnot. And I, I regularly attended that. And then um, Easter, um, I believe it was in April, the beginning of April, um, I got, I got confirmed and everything else. Um, and then from there, what had happened, um, just to add some context, my, my birthday's at the end of the month in April and I was confirmed, I think at the beginning of the month. And I remember this very vividly, um, at the end of the month on that weekend, um, our church, um, held a, what they, what they call it, like a, like a lock-in sort of thing where they got kind of like, it's where like a whole bunch of young kids basically from the church get together. And it's like a, like a, you, you spend the night at the church basically. And we did a whole bunch of events and other things like that. Um, and in the morning when my dad picked me up, it was my birthday, it was Saturday. And for whatever reason, on the car to ride home, I, I, I just, I had this thought to myself that I didn't believe in, in God anymore. Hmm. Don't, I don't know what, what came about with that. I mean, um, around that age too, I was also sort of, uh, there was a period of questioning between like age 11 and 12, I, I would say, where I, I started looking at just, just curious at different things. And, um, and I, I, I don't know, I, I don't know what, what happened in that, in that span between like 11 and 12, where, um, where I started questioning and then it sort of manifested itself after I was confirmed. Hmm. Um, I, you know, I kind of attributed to the, the spiritual roots weren't, weren't firmly set really. And that's what led me, led me astray. But basically, you, from, can I ask you a question? Yeah. Um, did you have secular friends or did you see something or read something or like on TV or what? Um, um, I think what it was, um, and um, you know, this is actually kind of funny. Um, right around that time, like in terms of um, influences and other things like that, um, um, I was, I had a couple of friends and stuff um, in terms of back in middle school. Um, you know, back then, you know, we, we shared music with each other and stuff. And, you know, my friends, um, I, I started getting into kind of like, it sounds very like uh, very tropey, but starting to get like into heavy metal and other things like that, mm -hmm. and, and so started to get into like you know different sort of um, subgenres of heavy metal or just metal in general, mm -hmm. um, like like black metal that kind of stuff, like speed so, metal. Uh, well, yeah, yeah, speed speed metal and other things like that. But you know, I also was starting to listen to things like um, um, you know, like Behemoth and vader and uh just uh mayhem and other other sort of you know very uh bands from that sort of norwegian black metal scene mm, okay um and they use a lot of a lot of those guys are are self-professed satanists and other yeah. things like that mm -hmm. and and that kind of led me down a rabbit hole of, of satanism and other things like that i actually had like a five five week stint of of that the Levee and Satan, Satanist sort of stint. Back in middle then. school? 
yeah, middle school, it, it, you know, middle school is a very tumultuous time for a lot of people. And, yeah. you know, you know, some people gravitate towards one thing I gravitated towards the, the whole, uh, the dark, <laughs> the, the dark scene. Yeah. Um, I, I got interested in witchcraft and Ouija boards and things like that in middle school. So I understand. Yeah. yeah I never went, never went that far, but I did dabble in, um, I was very close to actually acquiring, uh, the book of Satan by Anton LaVey. Um, and basically LeVay and Satanism is just, just, um, atheism, but just with, I don't know, like mass with, with, with Satan, like Satan's the mascot, basically. That's, that, that, that's the best way that I can actually describe what LeVay and Satanism is. It's just, mm -hmm. um, it's just really cringy, honestly, mm -hmm. if, if just, just to use that word, there's no better word to actually, uh, uh, use for that. But, you know, that, that kind of. Uh, implanted some doubts in my head and that kind of with Levain and Satanism that kind of opened up the door to atheism for me um, so coming from that like I also feel like getting into like Satanism that kind of also reawakened that whole um, that, that uh, when it went into rediscover Christianity at that age and that's why I went and got confirmed okay um but I feel like a lot of my doubts were still were still there, and and coming from that background of that of my Methodist church introducing like the um, you know the rock band uh, worship hour and other things like that, it, it just I, you know there wasn't you know Father Josiah Trim has 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 his book you know Rock and Sand you know mm -hmm. with you know and I, I think that's a very good kind of um, you know, a very good historical overlook, uh, overview of, you know, the, the historical trends within Christianity, but I felt like that I was rooted in, you know, uh, you know, my foundation was rooted in sand rather than rock, and that's why my, my spiritual house just crumbled because of that, and, and so afterwards, um, after that, that day, really, I, I you know, I, I fell into atheism, and this was uh, around, like, 2000, 2011, 2012, and if anyone you know watched youtube at that time or had any kind of recollection of the kind of like internet cultural zeitgeist at the time it was it was you know youtube atheism really was very prominent during that time and so i got swept away with a lot of like youtube content creators like the amazing atheists with um like sargon of akkad with um R and raw with the um, atheist experience uh channel um like with matt dillahunty for example um i know jay he, he he did a debate with matt i don't know how many years ago mm -hmm. but um basically that was kind of like what what i gravitated towards and and also watching a lot of debates uh with like richard dawkins and, uh, you know like richard dawkins and uh, 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 uh can't pronounce his name right i'm sorry but, you know, like those debates between like an atheist and a prominent, uh, you know, Christian, you know, watched a lot of like Christopher, um, um, Christopher Hitchens videos, you know, Sam, Sam Harris, that kind of thing. And was, you know, to a certain point, um, I was actually very kind of anti-theistic. I, I kind of, I, I hated God, you know, I, I bought in the whole trope that, you know, uh, God is this very malevolent, you know, angry, you know, sky daddy. That's what you know, they call him. Uh, sky daddy sky fairy um and, and and believed you know bought into that whole well you know if if evil happens in the world why does you know god's good why does god allow allow evil to happen in the world you know therefore god is evil you know just just really just low very low um low brow kind of arguments against against god and christianity and, you know, I've remained that way for, for a long time. I, I believe I was nominally agnostic for, for a considerable amount of my adolescence and going into like college. Um, but even during that time, I mean, I, um, you know, growing up, I've always had a fascination with history and culture and other things like that. And even just, you know, religion on a kind of, um, kind of as a study more so than anything else. And so at around, I want to say like 15, around 14, 15, um, I started looking at different religions a little bit closely, like the main, uh, main sort of world religions. 
Um, and the first one that I, you know, fell or gravitated towards was Islam. And I think the reason why I gravitated towards that was coming from Protestant background. I didn't really see the reverence coming from my tradition. And whenever I heard um, Muslim apologists, you know, talk about Islam and talk about how Muslims practice and how they prayed and their devotion to the Quran and their devotion to Allah, you know, I was like, oh, there, there, you know, there, there's something here that I have totally haven't looked at. And I also, my perception, what I was thinking at the time was, was, you know, very much influenced from, you know, growing up uh, in, in Georgia, growing up in the South and everything else. And so I kind of, you know, decided to take a look into it, you know, started watching a whole lot of Muslim apologetic, um, 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 Muslim apologetics online. And watched a lot of people um, who who used to be Protestant Christian, you know, telling their conversion story to Islam. Oh wow! And 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 their arguments at the time, not having, you know, the knowledge or at least the uh, what I know now, um, I didn't I didn't have back back then. You know, it was very, you know, very impressionable. I mean, <laughs> what you know yeah. about Christianity now? About yeah, 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 because I mean, everything back, you know, back then was either through uh, what I'd learned, like in Sunday school and mm-hmm. you know, some of that catechism that I had in the Methodist church. And then also, you know, the the memes, basically, the, the kind of meme sort of arguments that atheists have about about Christianity. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and so that was my Christian worldview or my background, my Christian worldview mm-hmm. background coming into Islam. And so, you know, it was, you know, they're, you know, the, the Muslim apolog- um, apologists were very convincing at the time. Mm. And they were talking about, you know, all these scientific, you know, um, uh, revelations that the Quran had, you know, the beauty of the Quran, what it actually means to be Muslim and what, what Islam actually means and how it's peaceful and then you peacefully submit yourself to, to Allah and all these different things. And, you know, uh, I, I was I was very much consumed with it for for a good bit. It even got to the point where I thought I was going to actually take the Shahada, which is their their confession of faith, basically. And in in Islam, it's one of the one of the five pillars. But in Islam, whenever you say the Shahada um, in in front of a witness, that that means that you are actually a, a, a Muslim. And mm-hmm. so I thought for the longest time that I was actually going to take the Shahada at some point in time. Um, luckily, um, you know, being being a teenager, I didn't have a whole lot of money. And I was trying to figure out, find, find my own Quran to read, you know. Um, and I found an organization that was actually give it like kind of giving away Qurans for like ten dollars. And luckily, I had enough enough money to actually buy that. So they shipped me one, and I started reading it. And and you know, and whenever I started reading the Quran, everything that I, I did not like about Christianity or that I thought was wrong with Christianity mm-hmm. was just, it was just like, it was magnified like a hundredfold within, within the crop. You know, I didn't, I, I didn't, I didn't reading it. I didn't feel, I didn't, I didn't see a loving, peaceful God that, that one should submit, submit themselves to honestly. And it really just, it, 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 it really bothered me and it freaked me out. And I just didn't, at that point, I had this feeling like it was it was wrong. It was it was wrong. And then from there, I kind of got um, it was very much um, um, disenchanted with it. Okay, I have so many questions. I want to yes. stop you and ask you some things. Yes, you were so young. I mean, I don't think I've ever met anyone who was interested in Islam at that such a young age. Mm-hmm. Did you? First of all, were your parents concerned at all? Oh yeah, yeah they were concerned. My, my dad, my dad was concerned. I think at one point in time, whenever I started getting into Catholicism, uh, I remember we were we were we were driving back home, and you know, I I, I started opening up the conversation about um, religion, or at least I was like beating around the bush and getting towards that, right? And and my dad basically turned to me, um, um, don't like like. I, I think I was about to tell him that like I was interested in Catholicism and about converting to Catholicism. 
and he thought that I was going to start talking about like converting to Islam. <laughs> and he was like, and he told me, uh, you know, don't, don't, don't convert to Islam. Don't, uh, you know, that, that's, that, that's one thing you don't want to do. Basically. That's, that's something that you don't even want to, you know, get into. Mm-hmm. So my, pa- my, my dad was very concerned. Um, I think my, my grandmother knew as well. Um, but my, my, my dad was, was very concerned um, about that. Uh, and did you know any people in real life that you uh, could talk to about Islam? No, no. I mean, you know, I found, I was able to talk to some people like online, you know, just ask questions and other things like that. But no, I've never, uh, I never had an acquaintance that, um, who, who was Muslim. Or I was there a mosque near you? I mean, how were uh, you going to do that? No, no, it was more so what what my plan was at the time was basically wait until like i was a little bit older to actually start like actually going to the mosque or oh yeah because you couldn't drive or anything no 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 no, (laughs) i couldn't drive so so everything everything was kind of like a a Mm self-study um and i really you know the like i tried finding like yeah i probably didn't do a good job at it but i tried finding pdfs of of the of the quran but I wanted something that was a little bit more kind of organized to actually understand like, like on how to read it and everything else. Um, so that's why I, I waited to, to get a Quran in order, you know, in order to read it. And whenever I started reading it, it was just, you know, I, I you know, I started reading uh, the second, I think it's, you know, the second chapter of the Quran basically and read that. And I was just like, it, it 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 didn't leave me feeling feeling good. I will I will, I will tell you that. So then, for the people who d- who have never read the Quran and just have heard of it, mm-hmm. there there are parts of it that actually say that non-believers need to be killed and stuff like that, right? I mean, isn't there like really violent stuff in there? I, I I believe so. I mean, I'm not of course I'm not the expert. Like my my sort of um, studies of Islam are you know, very, I don't know, um, seven years removed, not yeah. seven, more, more than that actually now, probably about nine, nine years removed, but I mean, yeah, I mean, and then there's also, you know, there's, um, you know, there are different sects of Islam as well. Mm-hmm. They're also like, you know, the moms basically like who are kind of the, the, the clerics of, of that, of, of Islam, mm-hmm. you know, they have their own kind of specific teachings and other things like that. I mean, it's a very, once you start getting down the rabbit trail of Islam, it's very, you know, it's not, I don't want to say it's not black or white, but it's very, it's, everything's nuanced a little bit, if, if I will say that. But yeah, I believe that there are specific portions of the Quran that do talk about um, violence against the non-believers and other things like that. Um, but if, but I would, I would have referred to someone like, um, like um, Orthodox uh, Shahada and that. Because I know that they they produce a lot of good videos specifically on on Islam and the kind of orthodox um, interpretation and perspective of what Islam actually is. And and I I just want to say I've known a couple Muslim people and Mm -hmm. I I really don't think they believe that non-believers should be killed so i just want to say that i i just said that because i've heard that i don't want to i don't want any of my audience to think that i think that every muslim wants to kill non-believers because i know that for a fact that that's not true and also did you ever get interested in sufism at all like rumi and the Um, i've i heard of it definitely i heard of it i think like um more of my interest in kind of like sufism or like the mystical side of islam kind of like began a little bit closer to now like like um i started looking at it a little bit like the more that i got into orthodoxy like more recently just because i didn't know too much about the mystical side of islam uh, um but at that time no no that wasn't that wasn't ever on my radar it was pretty much just you know sunni or, or, or shiite mm-hmm. for 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 me at the time and it was mm-hmm. basically just you and- know sunni just one last question um because i knew someone long time ago like oh gosh decades ago it was a really long time ago and it was a couple and they were becoming muslim 
And they, this was the first time I heard about praying five times a day and washing their hands and feet, I guess, before they prayed. And I thought that was really beautiful. And um, I, I liked that they, that they made a commitment to praying five times a day. I thought that was really cool, but that was all I knew about Islam. I mean, they were my first exposure to it. And I just wonder if that kind of devote, cause you had mentioned the word devotion earlier, maybe is this what, what drew you to it? It was yeah. like a lifestyle of worship. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, they took it, they took it seriously. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, mm -hmm. yeah, most, most Muslims that you do meet, I mean, are very, are very committed Muslims, you know, they're very devotional, you know, they actually, you know, they follow the five pillars, you know, very, you know, almost to a T, right? Um, you and know, you were it, comparing that to the Christians who just go to church on Sunday. Yeah, what, what, what I was coming from, basically, you know? Yeah. Um, you know, and it was very much a kind of, you know, I, you know, basically just kind of, wearing you know wearing wearing christ but wearing him only as an ordinary you know instead of actually you know living a life in christ you mm -hmm. know they were you know it just felt very artificial it just felt you know like like, like as i was saying before like a social gathering it was just right, something right, that right. you did on on sundays to you know as an obligation as a religious obligation but also as a social event mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so whatever whenever i discovered islam it was very much like wow okay mm -hmm. like there there's something there's something here mm -hmm. and so that's i feel like why i gravitated towards it but then afterwards after i got kind of after i read the quran and did did more and more digging you know more and more looking um uh, and i just kind of walked away from it and it never touched it again i i started going um uh, east i started going you know towards um you know towards buddhism and hinduism and like uh, Sikhism, uh, other things like that. I never really spent too much time with, uh, with those specific religions, uh, just um, just because I just I for for me it just it never there was always something there was always something missing mm -hmm. there was always something missing, and that isn't to say that you know these people aren't like devotional whatever may have you but um I, I think it was you know there was still that imprint of of, of christ somewhere on my heart mm -hmm. to kind of you know kind of orientate me away from that sort of stuff but what what ended up happening was i eventually um found paganism um european european paganism and i it, you know, it, the reason why that stuck with me was because I, I felt like there was some sort of, there was some sort of connection there, um, both kind of spiritually and ancestrally in that, in that, in that regard that I felt like, you know, it would make sense for me to, you know, at the time, this is my logic, believe, um, believe in a, believe in a religion that that's actually connected to my, my ancestors from, mm -hmm from long ago right mm -hmm. um and that's where that's where i gravitated towards and i felt like out of the uh you know it's very difficult to talk about paganism just because it's you know it's um you know it's it relies heavily on on reconstruction you know it relies heavily on a lot of kind of you're you're inserting a lot of modernism into it right like there are fragments from the past that you can kind of gather mm -hmm. but ultimately like what ends up happening is you're just you're kind of you're you're kind of basically pulling like a pantheon of gods really like in my case it was like the germanic norse gods and and then trying to slap a sort of worldview to it, you know and that's what i think a lot of like what happens with a lot of these you know this, this pagan revival movement that's mm -hmm. going on currently mm -hmm where you basically people are taking like the roman gods the greek gods the egyptian gods the norse gods whatever may have you mm -hmm. and and you're you're, you're and, and with some like minor like sort of sort of things like with within you know norse paganism for example it's very much on as well with this whole ancestral worship you know like with a lot of these pagan things but like in, in that specific flavor 
with like um you know these spirits they call them whites w-i-g-h-t-s uh like like the the hearth spirits or the hearth gods and other things like that and how to how to appropriate how to appropriately approach them and worship them and, you know kind of commune with them and everything else so were but you doing this or just learning about it I, I was learning about it like there were there were times and, and this is where where kind of my reignition of christianity comes back in so it kind of kind of starts right around that time whenever i find paganism whenever i find pa- whenever I, I gravitate towards paganism let's say and we growing up we had my my stepmom she she worked with um with a catholic woman and we were friends with her and her family. And that was kind of like my introduction to Catholicism. And there were a few times where we went to their church for some, um, some sort of event. Not, not specifically church related, but like at the actual Catholic church. And, you know, growing up in the South, you know, the, you know there's a lot of kind of suspicions about the Catholic church. You know, it's not really presented in, in too great of a light. Um, but due to all this, it kind of, you know, my, my interest started to get deep. And so, and also growing up, you know, I always heard the adage that, um, you know, you know, are, are you Catholic or are you Christian? You know, mm-hmm. like that question, you know, because, you know, uh, to a lot of people, you know, Catholics aren't Christian. It's two different things, right? Yeah. And so I started getting interested. That was kind of the, the kind of doorway that, that allowed me to reenter back into Christianity again, was, was through Catholicism. And being interested in that just because it was also this different different sort of thing and so from the time of like i would say like 16 17 um i became interested in learning about catholicism while also remaining nominally pagan in a way so like i would always like fall back to paganism and nominally remain there um but what had happened is um I started, I, I started, I, I went to uh, our family friend's church a couple of times, like once or twice. And whenever I went there, I found it to be very, um, like it had, it had the pieces that were missing from, from the Methodist church. Now, mm-hmm. like there was this, uh, this devotion and reverence, and, you know, and it felt also kind of old as well. And mm-hmm. I, I found that to be very interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, and after after those few times i kind of stopped um i kind of i kind of stopped just because that that um coming from that atheist background as well you know in my teens i still had those those um um the suspicions let's just say Mm -hmm. and so the suspicions got the better of me and then I, Mm -hmm. i walked away from it and then so can i interrupt you um yeah. so you because you had been watching so much youtube content very convincing arguments for atheism right so did those th- that just kind of like stayed in your head so you oh. would be, you would go to the church and you would be thinking about what you learned on the yeah. content yeah for, sure. yeah for sure um yeah and so that was that was the background mm-hmm. and then you know, moving forward, getting closer and closer at the, you know, towards the end of high school and then the college, um, I, 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 I had this, you know, this weird, you know, this experience for the better part of six, six years or so where around the summertime and I, um, for whatever reason, and I like to call it that, that, that Christ was knocking, knocking on the door. Um, because at, at this point, Doing my kind of survey of the different religions, and especially spending so much time in Islam, and then looking at the different ones, I I I knew I had I had this feeling to myself that I hate the, I hate using the feeling, but I I knew that if if anything had to be had to actually be set in stone for me, it had to be on reflection it had to be had to be christianity or had to be like my 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 paganism hmm. i don't know if that makes any sense mm-hmm. but but moving 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 forward with that what, what what happened every single summer that 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 occurred uh since like age 17 right around that time 
was that every single summer I'd have this, this urge to look into Christianity. And so I spent the better part of my, my summers, it would seem like, revisiting it again and doing a, a deep dive that I, I hadn't done when, when I was a Christian or the, the education that I didn't receive, I, I, I did on my own. Um, and, and, and through that, um, it took a while, but like for two, two or three years, looking at the kind of, at, at the church history, at the, the theology and the dogmatics of the Paul, uh, what, what I eventually came to, to realize is that if, 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 you know, Christianity were true, that the whatever whatever church it was the the thing that had to actually be present as as kind of as the cornerstone of everything had to be the um the true presence of the eucharist Hmm. and so that's where i kind of began my you know search for the the true church Hmm. Hmm. um in those in those like six years or so and and you know i think god that that's where i where i started yeah instead of going off of something else like mm-hmm. some other criteria like i don't know uh, like um i i can't really tell you like i don't know like the you know whatever church i go into has to have you know beautiful architecture or something like that or, or something you know um something that conforms with my own beliefs right mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. so yeah. I'm, I'm, you know, thank God, thank God for that. But, you know, and luckily for me, what it did was that in my mind, it really narrowed things down to kind of the three churches, uh, the Catholic church, the Anglican Episcopal church, and then the Orthodox church. And so I, I remained with the Catholic church for but quite you a knew, while. You knew about Orthodoxy? I, I knew about Orthodoxy orthodoxy i okay. wasn't i wasn't at all familiar with it i i knew that it existed and my my understanding or the scope of my understanding about orthodoxy was that it was the church that split off from the catholic church uh during the schism and that was that was pretty much the extent i knew russians and greeks were, were orthodox and that um it was it was a very at the time speaking at the time it was a very ethnic thing you know, mm-hmm. and there weren't a whole lot of Orthodox in, in the United States. So we just to clarify, so you you thought that the Catholic Church was the original church and then Orthodoxy split off from that? Yeah. Is that what yeah. you because that's yeah. I think that's what they tell Catholics, right? Isn't that well, kind of well yeah, and that's also like a lot of the times, like whatever like I, I remember, you know, in school that's how it was presented. But the church in the West, whenever that occurred, um the schism in 1054 the, the orthodox split from the the, the west the church okay the west. oh right and, because and, the way we're taught it's like everything is western based yeah. uh-huh yeah okay. unfortunately mm-hmm. so but yeah I, I remained i remained kind of in that catholic sphere for for a long time and there were many occasions where i thought that i was going to go through rcia which is their their um catechism right their um basically our catechism for, for orthodoxy um and during those many years of, of looking what what happened was um i was trying to pinpoint where, where where the actual truth um was and in conjunction with my you know revisiting of scripture of, of church history characteristics and other things like that and i and in that time, I was I was trying to believe that Catholicism was where it was, and but every single time that I would get back into it and, and start looking at things again, I'd I'd run into this roadblock of there were things that that always bothered me about certain things within the Catholic Church that kept reemerging whenever I, I decided to revisit it every summer. Mm-hmm. Um, and a lot of those things, it was really just like, you know, papal infallibility, you know, the, the Immaculate Conception, mm-hmm. um, the, um, you know, like things like the Adoration of the Eucharist, you know, the, you know, the, the whole Sacred Heart stuff, it, things, things of this nature, which really didn't, it, 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 
things didn't line up mm -hmm. um, with with the other stuff I was looking at. You know, every, everything in tandem that the puzzle pieces were like they were coming together, but th th there were a few that just weren't were fitting within that Catholic um, lens, basically. Mm -hmm. And I also spent some time like looking to Episcopalianism, and it. I got frustrated with that too because whenever I talk to a few Episcopal priests about, so how how, how do y'all you know like what are y'all beliefs about these specific things, mm -hmm. or how do y'all like decide on what what is dogma, what isn't dogma, and other things of that nature? And I was always told that, you know, from them specifically, that no two Episcopalians think alike, and that's you know that's an asset the Episcopal Church has, that you know, that you can ask, you know, two Episcopalians one question and you'll get two different answers. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for, for me, that just, you know, I walked away from that very frustrated and disenchanted from that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so after I eliminated Episcopalianism, it was really the Catholic church in my mind, it was just the Catholic church. And how do I, how do I become Catholic, but also try to reconcile these issues that I was having um, theologically with, with the church? um and there came a point back in like 20 2019 2020 where i was i was about pretty much done with um with christianity in the church and i was just like okay this this it isn't going to get resolved and so i became very kind of uh more a little bit more resolute with my paganism because oh. like as I said, that's where I would always fall back to after mm -hmm. after my frustrations just blew up and it was just like I can't I can't get solid answers on this. This there 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 are parts here that aren't lining up and I was just like I can't believe in something that doesn't <laughs> make sense. Like, like there are pieces here that do make sense, but then there are these other things that just they don't they they're incomprehensible basically. I hate to put it that way, but they are. Um and so in 20, 2019, 2020, I decided to revisit my paganism again. And, and I made the, the conscious decision of starting to actually um, do kind of do more of a deeper dive in there on how to actually like start worshiping appropriately. So, so I started. You, you hadn't up till then, you hadn't been in a men's group or I don't know what would you, you don't call no, it a coven, I, right? What, uh, did they, what they, do they, they call it? Um, they call it like, um, um, not, not kin, like, uh, like some of them call them tribes, some of them call uh -huh. them like other things like that. Like they're, I mean, I was, I don't want to say I was a part of a group. Like I was trying to like find a group, but uh -huh. there wasn't really one around me that I liked. So I never really got involved with it so much. It was kind of more of like, I was doing my own, uh, I was, I was, I was trying to, do as much as I could on my own, but I also kept on running into roadblocks trying to actually find resources on how to do things correctly. Do you, do they, not you, um, they do things according to the moon cycle and like the times of the year, they have special oh, oh, yeah. rituals like, and things? Like, like the solstice, I mean, that's the old tide. I mean, that's, I mean, that's, you know, that, there's that, I mean, yeah, there are, there are you know, specific, like there's Midsummer, for example, and just other things that they that they do incorporate in, in that. But I was also very wary of some of the things that I was coming across because even whenever I was pagan, I never, I never liked the whole astrology, new age kind of mm -hmm. stuff. Mm -hmm. I was never into like that whole, the whole Wicca kind of thing mm -hmm. where, where, where they started doing like magic and other things of that nature. I never, I, 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 I never liked that. I always felt like that. That was kind of, you were kind of, my, my thought at the time was that you were kind of combining two different things that, that, that needed to be separated. Like one was a, was a ancestral religion that was, you know, being rebuilt or reconstructed. And then the other one was something that was developed in the 1930s by mm -hmm. Alistair Crowley and Alice just, Bailey and Alice Bailey, and Hel and Helena and Blavatsky. Yeah. Yeah, and all and all and all that stuff, and it was it felt like that some of the people, a lot of the people within that movement were trying to combine the two and just basically mm -hmm. take take the pantheon of of Norse gods and just you know just basically 
you know, make Wicca Norse, basically, because they liked, you know, the Marvel movies or something like that. I don't know. But that's what it felt like to me. And so, like, some of the stuff that I was coming across online and some of the books that I was reading implemented those things. Like, with, um, like, the, like one of the big things was, like, like runes, like rune reading. Oh, yeah, yeah, like yeah. I got and, into runes when I was, like, 13. And, and for me, it always, that bothered me because I was just, like, that's not like it it felt like you were like they were trying to make runes in the tarot cards yeah Mm -hmm. and I was just like that's not that's that's not what runes are that's that's not that's not what it is so it for for me whenever I was pagan it was trying to weed through all that stuff but a lot of stuff like as I'm saying a lot of the stuff that I was finding and reading incorporated a lot of that stuff so I had to be very kind of selective Mm. and, and the things that I was reading and that's why I kind of thank God for this, that I held off from doing any kind of worship because I felt like a lot of the worship that, that I was like, the, the, like the, um, the procedures for, for worshiping, um, I felt like they, they incorporated a lot of the Wicca stuff. And I, and I, as I said, I, I didn't feel like, I, I didn't feel like it was true to that, to what the, the faith would have been. Did the they do of- any sacrificing of chickens or anything like that? Uh, I'm, I'm sure some, some did. But the main, most of the stuff, whenever I was going to start getting into it, was more of kind of like earth, earth worship, mm-hmm. like house spirits, basically, and offer offerings to, to those. Mm-hmm. But I never, I never, I was never able to actually fully complete my, my worship area or my altar table, for example. Like I was, I was very close. I was, I was very, very close from actually beginning. Mm-hmm. And then that's when, christ kind of like you know not you know basically you know threw the door off the hinges let's just say so 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 i'll I'll get to that in 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 college um i was interested in religion of course and i started taking a little bit a little bit of religion courses and we did a history of christianity and in that course i kind of found myself being on the catholic position but then there was that uh, I was talking to my professor, you know, about my struggle, because at that time I was like, you know, I'm going to RCIA, or I'm starting to go to RCIA, but I just don't like I, I'm I'm hesitant of like actually like taking that step to actually like go through the catechism process and be baptized Catholic. Um, and I asked him, like, hey, did you have like these issues like between like the big three? Because he was a very knowledgeable person about Christianity. And, you know, and I also mentioned orthodoxy because at that time in college, I knew a little bit of it. I actually found uh, uh, Bishop Kalisa's Ware um, um, introduction to the Orthodox Church. I read a little bit of it. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't read a whole lot because in that in his book, he actually starts he starts in the history of the Orthodox Church. And in that he, he basically tackles a lot of the heavier stuff, like the auto selfless nature of the churches and what the national churches mean. And everything else and i was really just trying to find like the meat and potatoes of, of it all and it just for me at the time it was very heavy whenever i was trying to actually solve these key key issues that i that i talked about before like the people infallibility and the immaculate conception and other things of that nature and and after that sort of like um questioning with him he what he told me was um he had he had the same issues with me, but he ended up basically he and his wife decided to go to the Episcopal Church, hmm. um, and that didn't leave me. It, and of course, that just enchanted me again because I already had my issues with the Episcopal mm-hmm. Church, and I saw it as it, it just felt lukewarm. It just felt very lukewarm. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, going away from that, um, I felt very dignified in my paganism. And after graduation and everything i was like okay i'm gonna actually take this thing i'm gonna take this seriously now i'm actually gonna start um you know worshiping appropriately and in my college town there there was a you know new age store and they had some like some norse pagan items and everything else that i was you know kind of acquiring a little bit and everything else um and then um you know um going into 2020 everything else uh you know of course it's when COVID happens and everything but right around the summertime in may june it happens again but it happens in a different way than than how it happened before 
where um, before it was just kind of like this, I don't know, I would call it like my, my soul or heart kind of leaping out, kind of like, you know, leading me back to Christianity or leading me to look back into Christianity again. But this time, and I don't, I don't like putting too much stock in dreams, but I had one that was very kind of, um, very much life changing because it did. So basically I had this dream where I, I saw myself, um, I, I saw this blinding, radiant, gold, golden light. And in this light, I, I saw myself, you know, weeping, weeping bitterly, um, denouncing my paganism, um, worshiping Christ, and basically just, you know, doing a 180, you know, and I woke up from that thinking to myself, how, how in the world, how, like, like, whenever I woke up from that, I felt like I, I like, kind of betrayed myself because I, I went from being, you know, this, you know, trying to be a staunch pagan. And then here, here it comes where I'm like, you know, like weeping and, and professing Christ as, as, as Lord. Wow. You know, and, and in March of 2020, I even got a tattoo, a pagan tattoo that kind of, kind of, you know, you know, cement that, you know, the paganism actually going down that path. But I felt like, you know, Christ literally like ripped the, ripped the hinges off the door and, and, and pulled me back from it. So I spent about three days pondering on it and, and chewing on what, what that, what that dream was. Mm-hmm. And I decided to go back home, pull out all my religious books that I'd bought while I was in college and everything. A lot of them were Catholic. And what, what I ended up finding was the Eastern Rite Catholic Church. Mm-hmm. And in the Eastern Rite Catholic Church, it was, I was also getting disenchanted with the Catholic Church because of the Novus Ordo, because of the liturgy, because I was touring a lot of different, different Catholic churches whenever I would go down to Florida, which is my grandmother. And like, I would go to one that was very reverent. And then I would go to another one where they pull down the projector and then you'd, you could read, you could like fall along with the hymn on a, on a projector screen and whatnot. And they'd have like, you know, guitars or whatever. And I was mm-hmm. just like, this is this is frustrating. This feels like I'm, I'm back in the Episcopal church. Again. Yeah. Um, and, and so whenever I found the Eastern right, you know, Catholic church, I was, I was like, Oh, well, this solves a lot of issues. You know, I see the reverence here. I see, you know, there's, you know, the Immaculate Conception is a thing. The Sacred Heart is a thing. All these different things, all these different dogmas that I was having issues with the, the Latin right of the Catholic church seemed to go away with the Eastern, Eastern church. But the problem was that the Pope was still there. And, you know, it was, you know, uh, and, and that didn't really sit well with me. Like, I felt like, like there was a solution to the Catholic Church. I could actually become Catholic, but I could be Eastern Rite. But what it actually did is that it actually opened up the door to Orthodoxy much more. So I started looking to Orthodoxy. And, and, and through that, um, and actually looking at Catholicism and Orthodoxy seriously now, comparing the two, um, I, I decided to go to, I decided to visit a Eastern Rite Catholic church in my, my hometown. And then I had a trip planned to Florida with, with some of my friends um, that afterwards um, I decided to visit my grandmother who, who also lives in Florida. Um, so before I left, I visited a, a, a Eastern Rite Church. It was a Ukrainian Catholic Church, and I thought the liturgy was beautiful, the chanting was beautiful. They basically, it, it's basically, it's, it's it's literally the Orthodox Church. But the only difference is that whenever we commemorate our, our bishop, they commemorate the Pope. Hmm. Literally, the only thing that's hmm. that's different. They they still oh, wow. do they still do the, the liturgy of Saint John Chrysostom, every, everything, other everything besides the the commemoration, um, but. When I was in Florida um, visiting my grandmother after my trip, I, I decided on Sunday again to go to liturgy up at this uh, Byzantine Rite Catholic Church. Um, and it was also beautiful, but I decided to talk to the priest. And I, I mentioned to him, look, I'm, I'm at a crossroads here between Eastern Rite, uh, the Eastern Rite, and Orthodoxy. I'm having these issues of, you know, the filioque 
uh, papal uh, infallibility, papal supremacy, all these different things. And his response to me was, don't look into the Orthodox Church. If you, if you go down to the Orthodox Church, you're going to like condemn yourself, basically. Oh, yeah, I've heard this. Mm -hmm. And that left me with something to chew on. But anyway, I had already planned that the next day on Monday that I would go to Matt's at, a, at or go to a service at an Orthodox church, and it happened to be Matt's. And this was during COVID, basically. Luckily for Florida, it was, it was opened up relatively. Um, but I go, it was like a 10 o'clock service and whatnot, and I walk in this Greek Orthodox church, and I'm pretty much the only there, only one there besides the chanter and the priest. And it's all in Greek. Of course, mm -hmm. it's all in Greek. And so I'm standing there throughout the entire service because I know I have to stand. I, I, I knew I knew that. And I'm just thinking to myself, oh, my God, I can't understand a word. Get me out of here. I, 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 I wanted to literally rush back to the uh, to the Byzantine Rite Catholic Church again because of, of that. Mm -hmm. But thank God I, 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 I stayed with it because afterwards I was able to talk to the priest. And I asked him, and I told him the same thing. And what he told me was, you know, um, you're, you're on the right path. Um, God will reveal to you, you know, the truth, where, 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 where you should be. Mm -hmm. And that was a day and night um, difference between what I had heard the previous day. And so from that, I really, you know, stayed stayed with that and before i went to florida um i i purchased um i had two books sent to my grandmother's house one of them was um we get the title right actually um bread and water wine and oil um by um Miletius, um weber um and i after those experiences i read the entirety of his book of uh, that one book. And it's basically, in my opinion, it's, it's, it's the better um, um, introduction to the Orthodox Church, in my opinion. Because everything that I, had, that I read in that book was, it was like, as soon as I read that book, puzzle pieces of everything that I had been looking at in the Christianity finally fit. Everything mm -hmm. finally like fit together. And the absolute richness and beauty of, of the Christian life of what it actually means to be a Christian was fully expressed in that book. Wow. And, and after those conversations um, and those experiences, I knew that, that the Orthodox Church had to be, because, because it, 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 it solved all the issues that I was coming across, mm -hmm. but it also was it, it put everything in the right place uh when it came to church history the, reading the church fathers scripture uh tradition everything and I, I had found it and i neglected to look look at it before but thank god that you know i was brought back to it um but that's you know and, and from that and from that moment i i i i, I knew i couldn't after that moment i, I knew i couldn't i couldn't come back from from the church of christ mm -hmm. because it was so it was so apparent that that you know one there is a god you know you know and you know he you know he's christ and and it just it was just everything that the, the i can't really put it into 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 good words at the moment but <laughs> It was. Let me let me let me try to find the, the right way to the phrase this real quick. Hold on. It's okay. Um, I I knew at that moment I, I could stop I could stop looking. Yeah. Because everything that I'd wanted everything that in reflection that I knew was a, a cry of the heart or a cry of the soul, I, I found it in the Orthodox church. And I could, I could, I, you know, at that moment I could stop yeah. and I, I knew I could be comfortable in, in the fact that I had found Christ's true church. I could mm -hmm. find, you know, be comfortable in the fact that I could find the full expression of the faith in the church. Yeah. 
because because it it is i mean you know and and, and thank god christ led me to that and, and you know and, and you know through the doors off the hinges um for me mm-hmm. but you know it, it's you know my you know you know, my, 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 my story is anecdotal, but I, I will say that I've also had other experiences um, on reflection, but even after, you know, you know, becoming Orthodox that I, 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 I know that, that, that God is real. That the Orthodox yeah. church is his church yeah. and that I can't abandon it based off of based off of, you know, personal, my, my, my own personal account. And I mean, if we have time, I, I'd, I'd like to tell one, you know, yeah, of one, one story. Yeah. Please. So, so <clears throat> after, after getting to California, um, I, I was, I was wanting to basically do a long road trip. Some time. And I'd found some time on, on, uh, on Memorial day weekend to, to do it. Um, my friend and I, we were going to, uh, well, actually, let me, let me actually, let me tell the story real quick. Um, before, before Memorial Day weekend, um, I was, um, you know, still doing a lot of, you know, reading, getting deeper in the scripture and everything else and buying, buying books like, like I usually do. And so my Amazon's recommended page is full of book recommendations and main, they're mainly Orthodox books. And so one day I decided to go just, just curious, just go on Amazon and one of the books that I, I, I see and that I've seen a lot was uh, Christ the Eternal Tao. Mm-hmm. I've seen it before and I thought it was very interesting. I was like, what, what, what is this book? Is this like some weird like new age ecumenical book or is this actually a serious book? And, and so I decided to click it, you know, to, to look at it because I'm like, eh, you know, I have time. Let, let me look at it. And so I click it, you know, and I start, you know, reading more about it and I'm you know and the author of the book is Abbot Damacy and so I decided to read about him a little bit mm-hmm. you know it says on on his like author's blurb or whatever that he's abbot of St. Herman um, of Alaska Monastery in Platina California I'm like oh <laughs> I've, I've wanted to you know go to a, to a monastery you know St. Anthony's was the number one that I wanted to go to mm-hmm. ever since you know coming into orthodoxy and knowing about you know monasteries and everything else but since i was in california i decided to look at where it was you know it's about five and a half hours six hours away from where i'm at i think to myself oh yeah i want to do a road trip this is a perfect time to do a road trip so i i I decided to tell you know my friend hey uh, you want to go to a monastery he's like sure i've never been to one he was lutheran um and so we make plans for that um, a couple of days before he decides to not go for, for, for another reason, uh, for some reason or another. And I, I go on my own and the, the morning of whenever I'm supposed to leave, I wake up and I think to myself, I don't want to, do I really want to drive six hours? And I, I had to tell myself to get myself out of bed because one, I I had bought the, the brothers up there some olive oil mm. so I had to so I, I told myself you, you bought you bought all you bought this olive oil you got to go up there you can't just you can't not just like buy buy this olive oil for them and not, not show up so I go up there I make it up there I make it up like right around noon and as I pull in uh, uh, Father Paisi comes out of the main gate and we start talking and everything else and I tell him a little bit about like you know what I told you about the book and everything else about Abbot Damascene. I mentioned Abbot Damascene, and he and he tells me, well, you know, you know, with Abbot Damascene's health and everything else, you might not, you know, you might not see him much, or you might not even see him at all. And at that point in time, he and another brother they go go in one of the vehicles and they do chores and whatnot. And then one of the brothers comes out. We walk down to the uh, to the guest house to put my stuff away, and I walk back up for the optional meal. And mind you, this is my first time at a, at a monastery. I'm by myself. Like, there are no other pilgrims there besides the brothers. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, I know, because I've read about, like, monastery etiquette before coming up there, that I know that they generate, like, a rule of silence 
So I, I think to myself, okay, well, what I have, I don't want to bother them. I don't want to, you know, like snoop around or anything, whatever may have you. No one has come out to do a tour for me yet. So I'll just go down to the guest house and I'll, I'll relax for a minute. And so whenever I get down to the guest house, I open up my, my luggage and I think to myself, well, what better time to kick up my feet and read the Bible? So I, I, I take my, my great grandmother's advice because she's always said that the, the first book of the Bible that you should always read is the gospel of John. Mm-hmm. And so I'm like, Oh, I'll, I'll go ahead. I'll re I'll reread the gospel of John. So I, uh, I prop myself up on, on, on one of their beds and the bed is, you know, and this is uh, pertinent to the story. The bed is up against uh, one of the windows of the guest house. And so I'm propped up and, and I read, you know, the first five chapters of, gospel of john they get to the part where the disciples are coming back from the samaritan town after jesus has talked to saint fratini at the well uh and right at at this moment i'm reading and i notice out of the corner of my eye something moving i just catch something brown moving behind me so i turn around and I, it's a bear oh and so, <laughs> so 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 i jump out I, I stop reading and Oh my and it's, gosh. It, and it's a That's pretty small, funny. it's a pretty small bear. So <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not so much worried about him. I'm more worried about if he's small, where's mama bear at? And so like, I'm thinking to myself, oh my God, what, what, what luck has it that, that I come to a monastery all by myself. There's no one around. I'm at the bottom of this slope and I'm going to die to, to, a, to a bear attack. I'm going to get mauled you know, basically, oh but gosh. the more that I look at the bear, it's, it's like an adolescent. It's like it, he looked more hot, and hungry than anything else. He was probably just looking for some water or food, but you know, I, I took a picture of him when, whatever his paws were up on, on one of the windows. So it's pretty <laughs> funny, but eventually after like five or 10 minutes of, of induced, uh, you know, high blood pressure and heart rate and everything mm-hmm. else, he, he goes, he strolls off and then, um, you know, I'm trying to calm down and, I, I try to sit back on the bed and read. And then one of the brothers comes down a novice and he, 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 he comes and gets me to, you know, and we do the tour, we do the tour of the monastery. And, you know, um, and on the, you know, as we're walking up back to the monastery, he asked me, so um, how do you, how'd you find, how'd you find us? Do you know anything about Father Seraphim Rose and everything else? Um, and that was another another reason why I decided to go up there was because knowing about the the history of, of Saint Herman of Ala- uh, uh, Monastery, you know, with the connection between Father Seraphim Rose, because I knew about him whenever I was you know starting looking deeply in the Orthodoxy, and then his connection, Father Seraphim Rose's connection with uh, Saint John Maximovich, mm-hmm. because uh, about like a month ago or two before that time. I had visited the um, Holy Virgin, in San Francisco, and so I was just like, okay, this is this is too perfect. I gotta go up there. I gotta actually, I gotta see it. <laughs> I gotta, I gotta see it. it I, you know, God, God made it. You know, laid it out providentially that that I would, I would, I would stumble across this monastery, and I, I, I just had to see it. And that's what I told him. That's mm-hmm. what I told him. And I get to the part where I'm telling him about, you know, the Amazon, you know, finding the book on Amazon and reading about Ab- um, Abbot Damascene, and we're sitting in the courtyard. And no, you know, and who else comes walking, walking down the path, but Abbot Damacy, you know? Oh. <laughs> and oh. so, you know, the, the brother gets up and, you know, he asks for Abbot Damacy's blessing and, you know, tells him that, that, that he's given me a tour and everything else. And Abbot Damacy comes and, you know, sits with mm-hmm. us and we, we talk and I tell him how, mm-hmm. uh, how I came to find his book and found the monastery and everything else. And, you know, I told him that I wanted to talk to him and whatnot if he had time and he said let's talk you know let's talk later after uh compliment well after actually after um the refractory meeting and so i was able to talk to you know to abbot damison for about an hour wow. um, <clears throat> after that cool. it was that was it was it was it was wonderful but anyway and and so um really the one of the reasons why I also wanted to go up there was to experience divine liturgy at, at a monastery. Mm-hmm. Um, and fortunately up there, they have their divine liturgy both on Saturday and Sunday. And at the time at that night, I decided to, um, I was going to leave <clears throat> the 
St. Herman's and go down to and, and go to divine liturgy on Sunday at Holy Virgin. So anyway, the morning comes on Saturday. <clears throat> I get there um, the day before on a Friday. So Saturday morning rolls around and I wake up and I go up and whatever may have you. Um, a pilgrim um, the night before he, he comes and we talk and everything else. So I'm not alone that night. Thank God. <laughs> with with a bear out yeah. you know, out there in the wild whatnot. but anyway so we um so i i go to the church and uh, for service and everything else and during the service um a, a young couple walk in you know the man has a beard and the wife has a has a head covering on everything else and on on first you know first glance looking at them i think that they're like bosnian or something like that i think they're like ethnic, you know not not american basically and so, you know, the service, of course, is beautiful, and then we have breakfast in the refectory, and I, and before I leave, I decided to go to the bookstore to pick up, um, 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 what is it, God's um, Revelations of the Human Heart, mm-hmm. the, the, the short talk that um, yeah. Father Sarah from Rose gave, because that pilgrim, he, he gave me the recommendation to read it. So whenever I'm in the bookstore, a couple comes in, and they're, they're speaking you know, perfect American English and everything else. And I'm like, oh, they're, they're American. So we start talking and everything else. I asked them, so how long did it take you all to get, you know, to get up here from where y'all are? And they said like only five hours. I'm like, five hours? Well, I guess y'all must be really close to where I'm at. <laughs> and so I asked them where, you know, where they go to church and everything. And they're, they're like, oh yeah, we go to church in this, in this town, you know, about like 45 minutes away from where I'm at and everything else mm-hmm. at a location that I didn't, you know, whenever I was doing my, my Google searches of trying to find um, churches in, in the area where I'm in California, it never popped up on Google. Like that church mm-hmm. never specifically popped up, but another church that was, that was close to it mm-hmm. always popped up. Uh-huh. But they told me about like during the pandemic, they never shut down. They have like, mm-hmm. 400 like, you know, converts, most of their churches converts. And I'm like, where the heck is this church? <laughs> you know? How far, how <laughs> Like, I didn't know exactly, like, where it was on, mm-hmm. like, I had to figure out, like, like if it was, like, you know, like, like, all the way up in, like, Milipedis or whatever may have you, like, how, how far exactly is this church? And so, luckily, I, I get enough service to actually pull up Google Maps where it actually shows me the map, and I find where the city is, and I'm like, oh, my God, this is perfect. I can actually go to, you know, I'm actually, I'm going to check out, I'm going to check out, you know, this church. Mm-hmm. Uh so what I did was that I left <clears throat> from the monastery around Saturday afternoon. I actually read the entirety of uh, God's revelation of the human heart um, right at where Father Seraphim Rose is actually inlaid. Oh. So, I, so, so I read it. I read, I read all of it right there, and it was, it was a beautiful experience. But I that just gave leave. me the chills. <laughs> That's it's, beautiful. It, it, was, it, it was a fantastic way to actually, you know, leaving on, on that good note and everything. Mm. <clears throat> but then I decided to book a room in San Jose. Um, and in the morning, go down to uh, this church, mm-hmm. check it out. And so I, I get to the hotel, I sleep, I wake up very early because I'm like, okay, if there's like 400 like converts here, there ain't, there's not going to be any parking. So I better get, get there super early. So I get there at like eight o'clock. And I roll in, and like only like a few cars are, are there. The you know the, the choir singing and everything else. But I walk in, and um, you know I talk to the the greeter at the door. I tell him where I'm from and where I where I came from. I mention, hey, like I'm, I'm from this area in uh, in, uh, in California, and he's like, oh, well, our our, our subdeacon, he, he he's he used to be from down there, and I, I'm like, cool, that's wonderful. And he and he told me that he'd, he'd send somebody can come talk to me <clears throat> so i do my i walk in the church i venerate the icons and i find a place to stand and then shortly thereafter the subdeacon comes up and we start talking and everything else and we're chatting and everything else and we eventually go outside because we're you know we don't want to be too loud and when I, while i'm outside while we're outside talking we you know i you know the, the priest shows up the head priest shows up with my with my now uh, godfather and so I, I meet you know the father uh, of the church like instantaneously and we, wow. we talk and everything else for a short short while and whatnot and, and then we go back inside <clears throat> and, and let me tell you that the church is absolutely absolutely beautiful the choir 
fantastic. It's, I mean, like it was just, it, it felt like, it felt like where I needed to be. Mm -hmm. And, and God confirmed that uh, to me whenever we got to the gospel reading, because the, when we got to the reading, the gospel reading, um, the deacon read the, you know, um, the gospel of John chapter five of when, when Jesus is, is, is talking to the woman at the well and Mm -hmm. he, he stopped right when, when I got to, whenever the bear uh, distracted me and and whatever, and and whenever, whenever he was doing the reading, I just got, I just got just chills and everything. And, you know, it, it, it felt like, you know, through that entire weekend, or that entire build up to me going to the monastery and afterwards it just felt like that the providence of god was so palpable that i it, it's so hard it would be insane to ignore mm-hmm. and i was luck, lucky enough to have the the head priest talk to me afterwards and i asked him like all like i told him like what had happened like my, my entire weekend like <laughs> how do you explain all these coincidences? Are these coincidences or the, like, what, what is it? And he told me, um, I'm bad at like direct quoting, but he, he told me, um, what, what CS Lewis said that basically after a while, when all the coincidences, um, when, when there are too many coincidences, you know, the coincidences stop becoming coincidences. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's providence. It's God's, it's God's providence. And, you know, that's just my, my own experience. <clears throat> but it and, and from that very you know from that moment like i i was you know welcomed with open arms at the you know in the church and i felt a lot of love there but i i felt like also that god laid laid out the the course of events in such a way to lead me to this church mm-hmm. and, and to have these experiences so, I mean, that's just another, that's just an example of what I was saying about <clears throat> um, the, just the palpability of God's existence. Yeah. Um, and everyone has these experiences, but, you know, mm-hmm. talking about them and, 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 and letting other people know of your experiences, just, it, it, it confirms you know, God's existence, because, you know, I mean, you can't just say that, that all these things were just coincidences, right? Mm-hmm. It's just, it, it, I think it would be absolutely, I think it would be more insane just to say, oh, it's just a coincidence that, that all these things happen, you know, and, and, and in a specific, in, in a specific sort of, um, you know, how they happened in, in specific, you know, frames of reference and time reference, you know, because it, 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 it it's hard to actually put into words because, you know, trying to think of any other way to kind of to to explain it just doesn't make doesn't make sense to me just to say, oh, well, X, Y and Z happen mm-hmm. because they just happen in such a way. And it just it, it just happened. It was just something that, <laughs> it was just something that happened and, and it happened to work out in such a perfect way that that. That these things align like to me that that like as i was saying it just sounds more insane than than you know literally god's uh you know influence in that or right. god's you know direction in in that yeah so but anyway i feel like i've been i've been chasing too many rabbits and rambling on so. oh no this is great i love that story i want to um i really wanted to talk about saint basil and spiritual warfare but i had this idea that i would love to invite you to be on a panel upcoming that we the topic could be spiritual warfare so we can really get into it more because we're almost at like the hour and a half like once once you give us your book recommendations and talk about saint basil i don't think there's really going to be enough time to really get into the huge topic of spiritual warfare Oh, oh yeah and i'm yeah complete i'm gonna you know complete novice at, at the whole spiritual warfare like you know 
you know thing i, I think i think that's the uh, you know the humble way to approach approach that um ju just because i mean i think you know with, with the whole spiritual warfare thing we uh i i i know i fall down a lot <laughs> i i fall down a lot and it's, it, and it's a constant it's a constant constant battle for sure but um but yeah i mean i'd love to i'd love to talk about it i'd love to talk about it as well great okay so how did you choose your saint your patron saint and tell us a little bit about him yeah so um i'm gonna say that i it was it was another another piece of god's providence again so <laughs> it there all all uh i'll shorten this story down a bit okay but um uh, so in July of last year, uh, my my now godfather and I made a made a made a trip up to Platina again for um, uh, Fourth of July weekend, uh, and we we met up with another person from the church. So the first day that we get up there, we go to the bookstore and everything else, and I at the time I'd been like uh, just thinking about you know saints like, like what 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 uh what saint would i take as my patron basically and i had about like six or seven different saints like in my mind you know mm -hmm. for various reasons and in the bookstore i i asked him i say hey um what what's the process like for like picking a patron saint like how do you do it? and he told me of his story whenever he was riding his bike one day uh on his way to the church that he just the name just came to him or whatever and whenever he got home he decided to look look up if if you know if this was an actual like saint or person and it turned out that 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 it was and that it i can't remember exactly what um what exactly he said about um about his his saint but that it was it was just so it was like like it just struck him basically like it just hit him over the head and it was right there for him, if that makes any sense mm -hmm. so anyway <clears throat> we um after after one of the evening services we go to refectory and um abba damascene's there and we're the only three pilgrims there but whenever at the end of the refectory meal whenever he's doing his announcements he, he introduces us to the to the brotherhood and so he goes, he goes down the line, he, he introduces my godfather, and he says his name, and he introduces the, our friend from, from our church, he says his name, and then whenever he gets to me, he says, uh, and welcome Basil uh, from, from, the, from, from our church as well. And Ooh. so we don't, you know, it takes about like a minute or two for, not a minute, a second or two for us to say anything, to correct him, to say my actual, like my, my birth name. And and afterwards, like shortly thereafter, my, my godfather, he's sitting right next to me, turns to me and he's like, Well, there, there you go. <laughs> there, mm. there, there's your there's your saint man. Wow. And uh a little before that anyway, I was I, I was curious about how uh you know Saint Saint Basil Cathedral in, in Moscow got its name. I was thinking to myself, is it is it named after Saint Basil the Great or is it some other saint? So I did a little did a little Google search and you know, that's when when I found out that it was a uh, Saint Basil the Fool for Christ of Moscow, and so that kind of played into it a little bit. You know, so my 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 saint is uh, Saint Basil the Fool for Christ, mm -hmm. um, and I I you know I I give I give credit to to God for for giving me that name. And are you a fool for Christ? uh i i feel <laughs> i feel like that's a um that, that's a title that i really gotta i have to actually you know work and struggle on mm. i mean um yeah i don't wanna i don't wanna i i i think it's a very you know with, with patrons any kind of patron that, that, that you do choose um you know emulating their life because you know learning about their life or even just reading the lives of saints is, is something very valuable for every Orthodox to read because, you know, that, because in their life, 
is the full expression of of Christ yeah. of the Gospels, and it's through their lives that we can actually learn more about you know scripture what we can learn more about um you know a life in christ because they they are you know they they are part of, of you know um you know this you know basic they're the ones who, who achieved you know sainthood yeah. in this life right you know for 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 various reasons but um i mean for for me i the reason why I picked him is because I, I need to do a lot of work on myself to actually, um, you know, live a life in, in Christ, fully in Christ. And that's, you know, that's why I feel like I gravitated towards him mm-hmm. and why God revealed that, revealed his name to me mm-hmm. so that I could actually struggle to, you know, learn and, and live his life um you know close to how how he lived his yeah. um, if you if you know anything about him he's uh yeah he he, he really the, the full for christ name is very very appropriate for for him he would go um he he was alive during the reign of um um czar ivan the fourth hmm. who was called um you know a lot of people know know him as like ivan the terrible mm-hmm. And so there are many instances where where he actually stood up to Ivan, and he was the only person in in Russia that uh, Ivan Ivan the Fourth actually feared, <laughs> because he wasn't he was he basically you know he he uh, Saint Basil was the one to call out his sins. Mm. Um, like there was an instance on during Lent, um, and I think it was either like at a feast or on the battlefield or, or somewhere. Or they're going, or Ivan is leading his troops, or something like that. I can't remember exactly what what the scene is, but um, what Saint Basil does is he throws meat ha- meat at him. I think it's whenever they're eating, so it has to be like whenever like he Saint Basil is invited to his court. But he basically brings meat with him. He throws meat at at Ivan, and Ivan is shocked and he says, "Why are you throwing me meat? It's it's Lent. We're not supposed to be eating." eating meat and then saint basil basically calls him out and says you know for you know for all the bloodshed that you've committed because at the time they were at war with a with i think like within russia or a different group of people that it would be better for you to eat meat because of all the bloodshed that you've that you've spilt during during lit so you know that's just um you know one of the ways that you know, Saint, you know, Saint Basil really you know, kind of, you know, yeah, he scared, he scared Ivan because he was so clairvoyant at age of 16. Um, like he was actually training to become like a cobbler and this wealthy um, um, mercantilist basically came in to get his shoes done. And he went to Basil and he said, you know, I want these shoes in this specific configuration. And Saint Basil said to him, why am I going to make shoes for you when, in three days, you're going to die. Mm-hmm. And the, the wealthy, the wealthy man was scandalized by it. And his, and his, you know, master that he was apprenticing under, you know, chastised him. But then three days later, you know, the man, the man died. And then from that point on, you know, he, St. Basil took, you know, a vow of um, asceticism and he walked around Moscow unclothed, basically. And he, he, you know, he, you know, did what, you know, fools of Christ do, basically. He was clairvoyant. He, he weeped and, and prayed for, you know, people, he, you know. You know, another instance is that um, he would throw throw rocks at, um, at houses of, of people, and people would ask him, why are you doing this? And he said that he was throwing houses at the demons, who were who were who were torturing you know you know the houses of basically the demons that, like who were trying to affect people who were very mm-hmm. like ardent in their faith mm-hmm. and then he would go around some houses kissing them at, at, on on their corners because he was he was kissing the angels who were who were protecting you know others in the mm-hmm. um, in the in the city of Moscow oh my so gosh that's wow. just a that's just a little um um 
you know, some, some stories from his life. So what are the books you wanted to recommend to my audience? Um, so I, um, there, there are a few, um, there are a lot of books that I, that I do like. Um, one of them I've already mentioned, which is, um, um, I, I, I recommend this to anyone who, who is just starting out with orthodoxy or wants to find out about orthodoxy. Um, Bread and Water, Wine and Oil by Melitios Weber. It's a, like, as I said, it's a, it's a beautiful book and it's one of the reasons why I made the plunge, basically. Another one of those is um, The Mountain of Silence by uh, Kirikos um, Marquides. Um, that was also just, it, it really put in view of, of the gospel and what orthodox like like a lived experience of orthodox christianity uh for me and it was it was it's a fantastic book i love that book another one is um the struggle for virtue by um, archbishop of erke um it's a very it's heavy i mean it's easy to read but it's also very heavy because it's um it, it talks about how to live the ascetical life in, in the modern secular society mm. and this was composed in like the 19 very contemporary like 1960s 1970s it's taken from a, a lot of his talks that he gave hmm. so i, I like that one a lot this one is is also much much heavier than this um but it's um sunflower by saint john of the bolsk who is actually you know funnily enough a, a distant relative of saint john maximovich hmm. and and actually saint john maximovich i i believe took his name, St. John, from his relative, St. John of Tobolsk. So it's a, it's a, it's a, the book is divided into like four chapters, but each chapter are divided into parts. So like each part may be like half a page to like maybe five pages. So it's very, it's, it's easier to kind of divide the book, but it's, it, it's very, very heavy. Because mm -hmm. the very first thing that, that he talks about in this book is why does God seemingly allow evil in the world? Mm -hmm. Basically talks, he basically talks, ta tackles the problem of evil. Mm -hmm. But the, the subtitle of this book is Conforming the Will of Man to the Will of God. And I think it's, it's this is one of these books that I believe everyone should, should read, okay. honestly. Mm -hmm. um, another one is... Um, Shepherd of Souls. This is uh, produced by Saint Herman of Alaska, but this is about the the life and teaching of Saint um, of Elder Cleopa of Romania, who was the um, um, the spiritual father of Romania during the last uh, during the last century. And mm -hmm. this this book honestly brought me to tears uh -huh. because Elder Elder Cleopa is just he's uh, there there are no words. But I recommend this one. This is also a very you know very short read, very light as well. Um, and then another one of St. Um, Hermit Alaska books that I, I love a lot is uh, The Love of God. And it's about the um, life and teachings of St. Gabriel of the Seven Lakes Monastery. And I just, whenever I bought this book, I read pretty much the, the first half of, of this book in a day. Oh, wow. And the first half is about the life of, of St. Gabriel. And it's just a, his, his life is like, as I said, no, no words, just, you know, buy these books, you know, good thing about a lot of St. Herman of Alaska, the books that they produce, they're, they're relatively cheap to how much content you can get. Like this book, I paid uh, $20 mm -hmm. and this is a thick book. A lot of their books are like that. So anything that they have produced in house is very good. They're, they're often an elder series, which I think they have nine now. And I believe they want to do, they're waiting to, write or, com or compile like two or three more i believe or there's one more i can't remember i talked to the one one of the brothers who, who actually works on the books not not too long ago whenever i was up there last time mm. and they're still waiting to uh, i think i can't remember how many of the optima optima elders there are but there there will be like one or two more publications i think of that series what what's the name of the monastery uh saint, saint saint herman of alaska I mean, um, where's St. Basil, I mean, um, St. Gabriel. Oh, okay. Uh, of the Seven Lakes Monastery. Seven Lakes. Where's yeah. that? Um, I don't want to say, I, 
a part of me wants to say it's near Kazan, but I don't think that's right. Okay, because I'll, I'll know, look into it. Yeah. Yeah, but it's a very I'm, good book. I'm really into learning about the history of monasteries. Wow. I it's so fascinating, and I love the ones that are in like the Sinai and Egypt mm-hmm. and um, like all over Greece and yeah, so cool. Yeah, I, I, I think a good book about like the desert ones is also another one of um, Kyrgios Mercades. I think it's oh, let me look it up real quick. It's let's see, it's um. Uh, it's oh yeah, gifts uh, gifts of the desert. Mm. That's another one of his books. It's also pretty pretty good. But in that, he also talks about like him him and his wife going down to the Sinai and also visiting St. Catherine's there. Yes, St. Catherine's. Oh my gosh, can you imagine? Can you even imagine going to visit that monastery? Yeah, <laughs> it would be it'd, so amazing. It'd be fan- it would be mm. just so spiritually enlightening. I can't I can't even explain it. Uh, and then one last one that I do mm-hmm. want to mention, it's, okay. um, it, it's a, um, it's more for, it, it's more of a worship book than anything else, but it's a, uh, it's a spiritual Psalter and it's produced by, I think, um, St. Um, what is it? Um, I can't remember what it's produced by, but, oh yeah, St. John of Constat Press in Tennessee, mm-hmm. but this is a, the, the spiritual psalter written by Ephraim the, Assyri- the Syrian. And so it has 150 of his psalms that, that, he, that he composed. Mm. And it's just my, my favorite one is, I think you can find a PDF of it online if you look it up. But my, my favorite one that every time that I read it, I, I weep. It's um, his Psalm 10. Okay. And it's very good. I, 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 I love, I love the spiritual Psalter. Um, of course, there's no substitute for the actual Psalter, but yeah. this one is, it's just, it's, it's perfect for like personal devotion. Mm. Well, so. Thank you so yeah. much for these great recommendations. Yeah, of course. So Basil, we've been talking for about an hour and a half. I just want to thank you again so much. And um I learned a lot from you, learned a lot about your story. I want to say that your discernment and questioning is very admirable. And, and, um, before I was a Christian, I didn't even know that Christians could ask so many questions. I always thought it was just like, you just read the Bible and believed in God and, And at such a young age, you had questions and you went out in search of the answers and it brought you home to the Orthodox church. And so that's why I'm so happy to have you as a guest on this show, because it's just the perfect conversion story for my channel. So thank you. Well, I'm happy to to have shared it. I'm sorry if, if it, at times it seemed like that I was, you know, trying to find the words or if I was. Oh uh, no, that's how it is. I mean, myself. no, I mean, talking about these things, it 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 is hard to find the words. It's hard mm-hmm. for me as well. And um, please give my regards to your lovely wife. And um, what else? I just thank thank you. Thank you again for this opportunity. And I can't wait to have you back on my panel. Wonderful. So well, we'll figure well, out when that will be. That as well. And to my audience, thank you again, as always, for liking and sharing my videos. If there is someone in your life that you think could benefit from this interview today, I would be so grateful if you would share it. And make sure you subscribe and hit the bell so that you're notified when these videos go live. We have a lot of fun in the chat. You can ask questions and leave comments. And if you don't get to watch live, you can always leave a comment for my guests in the comments underneath the description of the video. And follow me at Instagram at a devotional heart. All of my links are in the description. I have a link tree. It's a bit.ly link and you can find me at any of those places. If you're a woman who's interested in orthodoxy or even a baptized orthodox Christian who would like to be part of my telegram group, you can just send me a message on Instagram and um, I vet every person, make sure they're 
a woman and interested in orthodoxy. So that's how I do that is through Instagram. If you don't have Instagram, I have an email address in the bit.ly link. So until next time, I want to again, wish my guest Basil a very beautiful rest of your day and God bless you and your family and my audience. God bless you as well. And I will see you next time. Bye.